I'm sorry. A repentful heart. A genuinely contrite heart. I am. I am sorry. Well, brothers and sisters in Christ, the years about 1840, 1850, the Civil War just hasn't quite embarked yet, but we're well on our way, our country torn in two. The president's done all he can do. But for Edwin, you know, I got to tell you, his world was different. As great of an actor as Edwin is, and let me tell you, bar none, the greatest actor of his day, that boy could flat play drama, comedy, murder, mystery, stand up, impromptu, on the stage. It didn't matter. He's that good. You know what's great about Edwin? As great as he is, he, he just wanted to be left alone. He just wanted to live in his world. No harm, no foul. Didn't care about money, fame, fortune, and it didn't matter where he went. Everybody was clamoring. They would talk to him, visit with him, just sit and talk. If they could have taken a picture, they surely would. He was so good of an actor that when he went to England, you know, he did Macbeth 100 straight nights, packed the house every night. There wasn't a place he couldn't go, couldn't visit. You know, I'm going to tell you, he would always visit. Always a kind word, but I'm telling you, he just liked a simple life. So one day, man, he's heading to D.C., decides to get on one of those little platforms, catch a train to get there. You've seen the shows, right? You see it usually in the Western movies where that train comes into the depot and that coupling's a little too big and it jerks as it comes to the platform. Or worse, when it starts to take off, it kind of jerks until it gets that momentum. Well, it oftentimes would rattle the platform to a point where you, you lose your balance. Well, man, it is packed because everybody's got to get to D.C. He's standing in the back. Everybody notices him. So, I mean, how could you not? And, man, they notice him, but he's just, he just minding his own business. And, man, when that train comes in, you could have heard the scream. That of a mother. It was blood curdling. I'm telling you, her son falls between the cars. She is frozen stiff, and she is screaming for help. Nobody moves. Bless Edwin. Man, he bulldozes through the crowd. He's moving. He's jumping. He's up on the rail. He leans down. He grabs a kid by the ankle. And I'm going to tell you, a nanosecond from losing that child. Man, he risked everything, but that's Edwin. No harm, no foul. He just wants to help. Man, the mother doesn't. She can barely, she can barely eke out the word, thank you. Man, it's, that's Edwin. He just walks off, never says a word, just walks off. You know what's amazing? About two years go by. Edwin's brother, he's not Edwin. And as a result of it, he'd like to be like Edwin, but he's not. And as a result, man, he, makes, he gets involved in this incident. And I got to tell you, not only does it shipwreck his brother, it destroys Edwin. I'm telling you to a point, by the time Edwin passes, he has only two sets of clothes. He does no more acting. He became a recluse. He stayed out of the world, and when they do find him in his one set of clothes on the floor, he has a letter on him. The coroner comes, and the letter is from General Grant, or at least one of his staff, thanking him, and it goes something like this. Dear Edwin, I want to thank you for saving the life of that young boy whose father had been killed by Edwin's brother. Thanking you for saving the life of a young boy who had been killed by Edwin's brother. You see, Edwin's last name is Booth. And his brother's name's John Wilkes Booth. The young boy he saved was Todd Lincoln. And that was Mary Lincoln that was screaming for help. You know the last thing that they had on him besides that letter? Was Edwin making a statement that I felt sorry for my brother. But even more so for our country for we have lost a great man. It's just about the words of saying, I'm sorry. My brothers and sisters in Christ, that is exactly the point of that gospel. Repent or perish. You know, I never see that on a bumper sticker anymore. I see, I, I've seen rapture where this car may be evacuated on the time of rapture, which is contrary to scripture. I digress. I've seen everything he's loving and kind, but I never hear anything about repentful, about repent or perish. Now stop, now stop. Now please, you're a first century Jew. You know a lot about what's going on, more than you think. So man, we go back. Now remember who Luke is. He's a physician. He is not an apostle. He's never seen Christ, but he's a follower of Paul. And as a result, man, he is, you couldn't ask for a better detailed guy. He would have made a great detective. I mean, that guy's in. He talks about, he's telling about a story. Now remember, the good Lord has just made the statement. 
to his apostles and to, us, to a group of people that have gathered from Jews to Gentiles to pagans. He said, I haven't come to sow everybody together. I've come to sow discord. I will put father against son, son against father. I'll put mother against daughter, daughter against mother. I'll separate three verses two, two verses three, because I only care about one thing, that you make it to heaven. And it's only about the truth. I do not care per se about getting a vote and what's most popular. And now all of a sudden he's saying you gotta either repent or perish. My brother in Christ, Luke's now, and the good Lord's using two, you know what's amazing? Nowhere in scripture, outside of Luke, who wasn't even there when it happened, who wasn't at, dead, in, in, and wasn't even a first-hand witness, he gives them two incidences that no one else speaks of in scripture. Not nowhere. He says that Pilate, and then make sure you understand who Pilate is. Pilate is diabolical. Pilate will hate you because that's just what he does. If he doesn't like you, he will kill you. If he likes you and then doesn't like you, you're going to be killed. If he doesn't like you, there's not enough time, doesn't like you, there's not enough time for him to like you because he's going to kill you. He doesn't believe in trials. He believes that he's got to get out of the armpit of the world. So he doesn't care what you think or what you don't think. He goes into the temple. The Jews are making a sacrifice, which means they're, they're bleeding the lamb. They're putting it, kind of skewering it on the crucifix. He kills them, takes their blood of the people that were doing it, the priest, and mingles it with the blood of the lamb so that the Jewish people won't know it. So their question is, well, were the people that got killed in the temple, was it because of the sins they did or their parents? See, they believe that punishment and sin go together. 2,000 years ago, that's how they saw it. Today, we believe we have no sin. We're all good. Everybody's going to heaven. You ever been to a funeral where somebody stood up and said, I don't think he made it? That's how far we've fallen. Repent or perish. He's saying, no, it had nothing to do with that. And they said, well, what about when that, that big tower fell and 18 people got killed in Salaam? It was 18. That's the pool of Salaam. Remember when the good Lord took the mud, spit in the ground, took it, put it on the eyes, and told the blind man to go wash? He's got to walk several hundred yards to get to a pool to prove to people that he's God. A blind man is leading people who can see to see. And then they, and so there's a, there's a tower there that would watch over the pool. That fell. They want to know, those people that died, those 18, it was because of their sins or their family? He's saying no. It's got nothing to do with it. Your sin is your sin. Whether somebody comes or goes in this world is only his decision. You're making a correlation that doesn't belong. He said, that's like the, the man that I cured the other month. The one that they said, well, man, he was blind since birth. Was he blind because of his parents? And he said, no. He was blind so that I could prove to you I am God. Hence why he cured him. My brother and sister in Christ, that's what he's trying to tell them. You're getting caught up. you got to repent. It's, your sin is your sin. This is why the man comes to him and says, look, I know you had that fig tree. And just so you know, whenever you hear a Jew use the word fig tree, they believe that's the tree in the Garden of Eden. That's the one they cannot eat from. Hence why they're wearing fig leaves. My brother and sister Christ, he's saying, look, give me one more chance. That's what he's saying. You need to say, I'm sorry. My brother in Christ, look, go back in Scripture. There's a tradition with Peter, small t, which means the saints speak to it. And it is directly or indirectly tied to Scripture in a way. Peter has a problem with Judas. He's always had a problem with Judas. Judas has a problem with everybody. It just so happens Peter's the vicar. And Peter's telling him, man, you know, it's, it's every time we go, it's a problem. Every time we go, there's an issue. I find out something, you don't tell me the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Man, he's gotten sideways with him. So he's walking with the good Lord, he being Peter, and says, man, Peter, I understand your struggles with Judas. He said, no, Lord, you don't understand. He said, no, you don't understand. When I finally leave, you're going to realize that the greatest school you went to, the greatest education you got, the most knowledge and experience you'll bank on, well, because you walked with him for three years. And he said, well, man, Lord, I just don't want to forgive him. How many times must I forgive him? He's looking for a number so he can, did that one, check that one, did that. He's saying seven times. And the good Lord's saying, no. Seven times 70. Now stop. You got to understand this. When Cain kills Abel, 
for seven generations, he's always looking over his shoulder. Seven to a Jew is the most complete number in the world. Seven years to build the temple, seven days of creation. Seven is complete. So for seven years, Cain is looking over his shoulder because of what he did to his brother. Seven generations later, a guy by the name of Lamech comes into the world. An offshoot of Cain, he kills another man too. But this time, the penance is seven times 70. So when Christ says, no, Peter, it's not seven like Cain, it's closer to seven times 70, which is 490 years. This is why Daniel uses the number 490 is the complete forgiveness. He's telling him, the more you sin, the longer it's going to take. The less you deny that you need to repent, the longer it will take. The longer it takes you to say you're sorry, the longer it will be for you that you'll stay in the muck and the mire. My brother and sister in Christ, here we sit 2,000 years later. You know, I got to tell you, outside of the words thank you, the most powerful in our language, I'm sorry. But yet we simply refuse to make that compliment. We just simply refuse to add that contribution. We simply refuse to own up. Lord, Father, you don't understand. It wasn't my fault. And I am not going to say I'm sorry. So we're so worried about winning the argument because, we're, well, we're keeping score. I mean, I mean, somebody is keeping score, that regrettably. Unfortunately, it's not you and I. So here's the problem. You and I refuse. So it's more important to us, it is more important to you and I that we protect our pride than we protect our relationship. Because if I say I'm sorry, then I admit I'm wrong. As if somehow or another, that's the be all end all. My brother Christ, how many times has somebody sent you an email or text message or whatever the case may be? Man, you are so incensed. Man, you can't wait to write an answer back. And be damned if I'm going to apologize for it. And as a result of it, man, the fumes and the fire just can bring, and then he, man, it gets everybody. It doesn't just stop with that person in the family. It goes to the next person. And it goes to the next person. Next thing you know, it's at the dinner table. Next thing you know, it's in the family room. Next thing you know, it's in the house. Next thing you know, it's even at work. And then it goes to work back to the house. All because, man, we got territory. We're not giving it up. But brother Christ, don't you see? The devil wants you to live in that world. He wants you to say that, no, it's more important you protect your territory. It's more important you protect your, so your spot than it is your relationship. Or are you more alert about you or your family? You're more worried about you or your relationship with your workers. You're more worried about you or your relationship with Christ. At the end of the day, you and I are not saying we're sorry because, man, there's just something to it. Look, listen to me. Think first. Just think. In the words of Winnie the Pooh, think, think, think. The man's on the crucifix. His name is Dismas or Disma. He is the good thief. You know what's amazing? Not one time during the six hours, three hours he carried the cross and the three hours he's on the cross, does he ever see the blind see, the lame walk, and the dead rise? So how does he go from being the thief to the good thief in six hours? Enough to say, in his words, I'm sorry. Just remember me. Just have a thought of me. They're about to break my shins and I'll spend all eternity in hell. He's killed over 1,000 people, killed his brother. And seconds away, what causes him to say, oh my God, remember me. He's so sorry. He didn't even, can't even barely utter the words, remember me. I truly believe at the end of this day is because when he met Christ 32 years ago, and he did when Christ is fleeing in the desert with Joseph and Mary, because Herod's on a rampage, he controlled the desert. And he did allow them to pass free. And he did tell the good Lord, grab this. Remember me someday that our paths ever cross, end quote. He's saying, look, if all you can do is remember me, please do. I am so sorry for what I've done. Why does he do it on the cross now? I've got to believe, not because he recognizes Christ, because Christ was a two-year-old, albeit God. He recognizes it because the Blessed Mother hasn't changed, and she intercedes. And his gamble is, what do I have to lose? I might as well admit publicly that I love him. And because he does, because he says, I'm sorry, in his words, the good Lord mitigates everything he owes. Repent, and man, you'll be with me forever. I will use your crucifixion, and I will make sure that you amends for all the people you killed. 
I will use your crucifixion for all the money that you stole. I will use your crucifixion for all the plunder and the heartache that you caused people. And for your own family, because you went public, I will use your crucifixion. This day, welcome to my paradise and welcoming to Abraham's bosom until I open the gates of the kingdom of God on Pentecost. My brother in Christian Christ, because he says one or two words, I'm sorry. Man, everlasting life. My brother and sister in Christ, what about Judas? He's two words away from being Saint Judas, still being one of the 12. I'm sorry. He gets so caught up in depression and then despair that he doesn't believe the good Lord can forgive him. My brother and sister in Christ, when I spoke to my friend the exorcist and I asked him, man, you ever hear anything strange? Anything ever come out of an exorcism that's just, well, I never thought of it that way. He says, all the time. I said, anybody ever show up that you didn't expect? All the time. Anyone I would recognize? He said, yes. I was expelling, there was a couple of demons, three actually in particular. One was Lucifer, there were two others. They told me somebody else had joined in the fray. I said, who would that be? He said, I said the same thing. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the fourth person? He said, Judas the Iscariot. My brother's Christ, he's two words away. Pride run amok. I got to win. I got to keep score. It's more important. I'm not apologizing. I, I, I didn't do anything wrong. Pride or relationship? Pride or life everlasting? My brother and sister in Christ, I leave you with this. Miss Mary Angelou, I believe is her name, is absolutely spot on. People will forget what you say. People may forget what you did. But they will long remember how you made them feel. Just say you're sorry. Get that attachment off of you so you can have a peace-filled life. Amen? Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.